turns pretty good, it's still understeering a lot. Wow, that was close. See, I can't keep my eyes far enough ahead. Wow, that was close again. I don't have it in me. So it's been quite a ride with the RC Hypercar. All the electronics are actually finally installed and working. The car is all wheel drive now. And to take it even further, I've added torque vectoring and the grippier tires. And the acceleration and braking are shockingly quick. And overall, the car is a completely different beast from when it was just rear wheel drive. Let's start off with the actual all wheel drive conversion. Like I mentioned in the last video, I added two 900 kV 2810 brushless drone motors to each of the front wheels. Like the rear wheels, I've placed two AS5047P magnetic encoders on the back of the motors so that I can provide the main ECU with very accurate wheel speed data. This may seem like an actual trivial task, but the sheer number of wires between the actual motor power wires and the wires for the encoders resulted in me basically redesigning the entire front suspension. It just barely fits because it has to have enough room for the wheels to steer, but it fits and works for now. I switched from two individual RC car ESCs to the single KM55 4-in-1 ESC running the AM32 firmware. It's an awesome firmware used by a lot of RC rock crawlers, so it's ultra smooth even at low speeds, which is perfect for these direct drive motors since I don't have any kind of gearing to help smooth out the torque delivery. The most important benefit from the new ESC is that the torque output is very linear with the throttle position. Most RC car ESCs have a very non-linear torque delivery in the first part of the throttle to try to make the car feel faster off the line. But since I want very accurately to control the torque of the individual motors, it's a lot easier for me to deal with an ESC that just has a, something like 50% throttle, roughly equate to 50% motor torque. Also, I was worried about how the high amperage draw of an RC car would affect the ESC. So I went ahead and designed this mounting bracket and fan to actually cool the ESC. And it's worked perfectly over uh, extended runs during testing. The AM32 based ESC also has the ability to output standard KISS formatted telemetry for each of the motors. I'm not utilizing this yet as it's not super accurate or fast compared to say the wheel encoders, but I think in the future that I might be able to characterize the motors and be able to try to eliminate some of the sensors and kind of save some weight and space in the car. Surprisingly, the all wheel drive conversion had the most impact on the car's stability and performance when braking. Having front brakes means the car no longer wants to swap ends every time you hit the brakes, particularly in corners. Uh, the additional brake force from the front wheels combined with the monumental amount of aero downforce and drag allows the car to pull nearly 10 G's of peak deceleration and 5.5 G's average from 70 mile an hour to zero. In a straight line, the car stops from 70 miles per hour in roughly 18 feet or 5.5 meters. I've actually needed to go back and add more Velcro to the battery pack to keep it from detaching inside the car. Video just doesn't convey how insane driving this car is. Uh, even in huge parking lots, you run out of space so quickly. You just find that you're driving the car at full throttle all the time. The downforce increases handling so dramatically at those high speeds that you find yourself just making really dumb decisions. I built this car to get hands-on learning with different motorsports technologies and different automotive technologies. And torque vectoring is something that I've always wanted to learn more about and try to be able to understand more about how it works. If you're not familiar with the term torque vectoring, it's simply varying the torque output at a particular wheel to help steer the car where the driver wants the car to go. By varying the torque at the wheels, we can dynamically change the handling characteristics of the car to better match what the driver is actually asking the car to do. This allows for improved performance over a wider range of cornering situations or can make up for a vehicle design or a setup compromise for the car. 
This is perfect for the RC hypercar, which has a suspension designed for high speed downforce, really at the expense of low speed handling stability. Torque vectoring can accomplish this in a number of ways, such as using the brakes or something like a computer control differential in a normal car. The RC hypercar has what I would consider the ultimate setup, which is an individual motor for each wheel, which allows for near instantaneous addition or subtraction of torque at any wheel at any time. This picture shows kind of a rudimentary example of how torque vectoring works. If the car is actually understeering, meaning that the front wheels are slipping and the car won't turn any tighter, we can actually increase the torque on the outside rear wheel to increase the rear slip angle and to lower the torque at the front inside wheel, which actually allows the car to turn tighter. And if the car is oversteering, meaning that the rear of the car is sliding out and the car is trying to turn too much, we can do the opposite action to the other pair of wheels. We can increase the torque of the outside front wheel, which increases the front slip angle, and we can decrease the torque going to the outside rear wheel. And this will just basically cause the car to handle more neutrally. Even the rudimentary torque vectoring I implemented has actually transformed the way the RC hypercar performs below 30 miles per hour, where the stiff suspension and bumpy surfaces and low downforce causes the car's handling to be very unpredictable. Now you can turn tightly and apply the power and the car goes exactly where you want it to go. For the technically minded viewers, I'm going to dive into the actual inner workings of the RC Hypercar's torque vectoring controller, since I know a lot of you kind of understand how this works better as well. A torque vectoring controller's job is to dynamically manage the yaw rate of the car, or how fast the car is rotating about its center of gravity measured in degrees per second or radians per second in my case. When the driver turns the steering wheel, the microcontroller inside the car actually calculates the expected yaw rate under ideal conditions from a kinematic model of the car. At the same time, uh, using the gyro inside the inertial measurement, the BNO085, we can measure the actual current yaw rate of the car. The difference between the demanded yaw rate and the actual measured yaw rate, how the car is actually reacting to the real world, can be used to dynamically redistribute the torque at the individual wheels a couple hundred times per second, thereby actually minimizing the difference between what the driver is demanding of the car and what the car is actually doing. Uh, like I mentioned, to calculate the demanded yaw rate, we need a kinematic model for the car. Uh, for the purpose of torque vectoring, the majority of the benefit can be found using a very simplistic model called the bicycle model. The bicycle model takes the four wheels of the car and simplifies them into just two wheels centered between the front and rear wheels, basically on the center of the front and rear axles. The bicycle model does not take into account anything like weight transfer, suspension stiffness, tire behavior, or error loads, but it's a reasonably accurate way to model the yaw rate and slip angles of a vehicle, which is what we're looking for primarily. When using the bicycle model, the yaw rate is easy to actually calculate. And this is the formula here in that little white box. I'm already measuring the majority of the values for these variables from existing sensors on the car, like the GPS or the IMU or the wheel encoders themselves. I don't have the steering angle though. And the steering angle is the angle of the front wheels themselves. Now the bicycle model assumes we're treating both front wheels as a single wheel centered on the front axle. Now in the real world, the front wheels don't actually turn at the same angle. And you can check out my earlier suspension videos where I kind of talk about Ackerman. 
I've decided to roughly estimate the steering angle of that central front wheel to be the average of the inner and the outer wheel angles. Of course, to do all of this, the RC car transmitter steering wheel position has to be translated to the steering servos position. And then that has to actually be translated to the front wheels actual steering angle. To make things less complicated for now, I've chosen to just assume the servo moves to its commanded position instantaneously. So I just use the CAD model itself to measure the actual angles of the front wheels. I move the servo arm in five degree increments from minus 30 degrees to plus 30 degrees, which is the total steering range of the servo itself. And at each increment, I took a measurement of the angle of both of the front wheels and recorded these in a spreadsheet. And as you can see here, this is the chart showing the input microsecond value at the RC transmitter and the resulting mean front wheel angle. For our purposes, a linear approximation is more than close enough for mapping the steering input to the actual front wheel angle. The result is that I now have a method inside my code that takes in a microsecond value and outputs the front wheel angle so that we can actually use this in the bicycle model. Now I'm not going to talk about all the possible control strategies for torque vectoring because I'm not really that knowledgeable on the subject and there are so many complex mathematical models for doing this. But for this particular type of system, from my research, a large percentage of the benefits of torque vectoring can be realized with just a simple proportional controller. And I can always try some of the more complex methods later on down the road. So to implement a proportional controller, we just take the difference between the target and measured yaw rates, and out of that we get an error value. Then we take that error value and we multiply it by some proportional gain to actually map it to some change in torque that we want in the system. Uh, the bigger the error, the bigger the correction value, basically. So the correctional value is used by the controller to vary the torque at the wheels. For testing purposes, I made this extremely easy. I can use one of the trim pots on my RC transmitter to turn the gain up from zero to a, a very large number to see how it actually affects the handling of the car. So now we have the correction amount we want to change the torque by, but we actually have to now distribute the torque uh, correction to the appropriate motors. And this is where we need some additional logic because we have more than one solution for being able to correct the actual yaw rate of the car because we have four different motors. So first off, in the real world, we're actually limited on how much torque a motor can provide. If one of the motors is providing 100% of its available torque, and we want more, instead of adding more torque to that motor, we can actually double the amount that we want to reduce the opposite wheel by. And it actually results in a very similar solution to if we had added torque to that other wheel. Alternatively, what I chose to do initially was to just cap the motor output at some percentage, uh, say at 90 or 95% when the car is turning. This works out very well for the RC hypercar, primarily because at high throttle percentages, the car is usually going quite fast and the aerodynamic forces have taken over anyways, and they're really balancing out the car much more than the torque vectoring. At low throttle, the car can still make really large changes to the torque output of the motors and have it affect the handling. And this makes the car feel very lively and you can see how tightly it wants to turn all the time, but at the same time, it doesn't spin out at low speeds like it did before when it was rear wheel drive or even when I turned down the torque vectoring gain a lot. Um, at low speeds, the car will tend to try to spin out or understeer. It's just not very controllable, particularly going over bumps. The last piece of the torque vectoring controller is the actual logic to distribute the torque to the appropriate wheels. And for this, it's just a simple if then tree to determine if the car is oversteering, i.e. the yaw rate is positive, or if it's understeering, i.e. the yaw rate error is negative. And then we have to check to see if the car is turning left or right, which is just determined by the steering angle. So then the torque vectoring can actually distribute based on that to the appropriate pair of wheels, the actual torque correction so that the car turns either tighter or less tight, depending on what uh, direction that is actually in. 
So torque vectoring is actually really awesome for the RC hypercar because it also acts like stability control that doesn't slow down the car. It's very transparent and it makes the car so much easier to drive at low speeds. A huge thing for me was actually hitting small rocks at low speed, which would cause the car to spin out of control and it no longer does this. And also unexpectedly torque vectoring actually increases the maximum handling capabilities of the car as well at top speed. My theory is because the tires don't actually perform in a linear manner, that the torque vectoring has helped to manage the slip angles of the car over the bumpy uh, parking lot surfaces. Either way, torque vectoring is worth about 0.4 Gs of lateral grip with it on versus it off. I'm pretty proud of the car's performance now and these maximum lateral Gs are actually uh, half a second sustained averages. So now we're actually seeing four plus lateral Gs sustained for half a second and I'm seeing peaks well over five Gs now. I know based on comments from the previous videos, there's a strong demand for people wanting to build their own RC hypercar. So that's my next goal. I'm printing the final version of the monocoque with a bit more downforce on the front with some additional ground clearance and a long list of fixes that I've found throughout the RC hypercar testing. I just plan on providing very simplified implementation of the electronics. Uh, I do not plan on having any microcontrollers or anything like that. I think the car performs fairly well without a microcontroller. And honestly, it would take me hundreds of hours to be able to document all of my code and the work required to make a microcontroller work in this particular car. So this is gonna be a wrap for the development on the RC Hypercar for now. I do have some plans for testing different ideas on the RC Hypercar. I'd love to have a DRS system. I'd love to get the traction control fully implemented on the car to see how it handles. I think it drives pretty well for what it is. And I just wanna go out and drive and enjoy the car enough and see where it goes from there.